Welcome everybody and uh, it's a great pleasure today to continue our Dementia Research Oxford series um, with Sarah Pendlebury. And Sarah, as many of you know, is Professor of Medicine and Old Age Neuroscience here at Oxford. Uh, unusually, she studied medicine both at Cambridge and Oxford, decided to make the right choice and come and stay with us. Yeah. Um, she's, she's made lots of contributions to stroke and transient ischemic attack research through the Oxfax uh, cohort, which she might touch on as well in this talk. But for more than a decade, Sarah has really been interested in an area which many doctors realize is a common problem, but has been very difficult to study. And it's also quite a dirty area because it's so, so multifactorial, so many people present with it, and yet we understand so little about it. But she's made some really pioneering strides to develop an infrastructure here at Oxford to perform research on people with delirium. And she's going to tell us about that and a few other of her findings today, which I hope you'll all enjoy. We're recording this and we'll also be taking questions in the chat right at the end. So if, you, if you've got thoughts as you go along, you can put them into the chat, but we won't take them until the end. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Ms. Leach, um, for that kind of introduction and um, also for highlighting very much the, the, the problem with, um, with delirium in particular for the, um, the hospital service and for indeed the health system and the social care system as a whole. And I'll come and talk a little bit about that um, in more detail towards the, the second half of the talk. So I'm going to talk about vascular and systemic factors um, and really how they interact um, in, in increasing the risk of both dementia and delirium and how that they're intimately uh, interconnected. So I mean, I'll talk about um, the Oxford vascular study as you alluded to, Masu, to start with, because it's really been the sort of spring point of this work. Um, but then I'll come on to talk more broadly about, as you say, what's this really very complex and challenging area um, of delirium and how that impacts dementia risk and, and what the implications might be for understanding mechanisms around dementia. Um, so, so this work all with Oxfask in terms of dementia really started uh, quite a long time ago now when I did a a big systematic review with Peter Rothwell on the um, dementia associations of stroke. Um, and what was clear from these data um, were firstly that there were the very few population-based studies, most of it was based in, in hospital cohorts, and also that the, the case mix, which um, had really not been looked at in a lot of detail, was really key to um, the estimates of the dementia risk. So as you might uh, not be surprised to hear, the risk is much lower if you're looking at population-based studies where you're including both very mild events and, and more severe events and, and is much, much higher, several fold higher, um, when we look at patients presenting to hospital who have a history of stroke. So, so you know, varying from 7% in our population-based studies, the first ever stroke, right up to 40% in patients presenting with, with recurrent events. And so that um, led us really to start looking at dementia in more detail in the Oxford vascular study, which is a population based study of, of all acute vascular events that's uh, centred on a de defined population within Oxfordshire. And in terms of the dementia work, um, just some important points to be aware of. So the first is that because um, there are very close links with primary care in the study and because primary care really in the UK is unique in holding um, a lifetime health record for an individual. That really allows us to um, gain much more accurate data on dementia and particularly to mitigate a lot of the selection bias that happens in, in studies that include older frail patients and also that allows us to make sure that we don't lose them to follow up. So there's a certain amount you can do by, by in, enhancing follow-up by offering, for example, home visits and telephone follow-up, but there will still be individuals who become too old or too unwell or don't wish to continue the, the in-person follow-up. 
And so in Opsas, what we do is that we actually review the entire record. So this is not just using coding and digital follow up. It actually involves um, myself going into GP practices and looking at the full GP consultation record, because often you can infer dementia diagnosis against accepted criteria on the basis of what's written in the GP record. So, so that's that's a key strength of, of Oxfast. And we were able to use those data um, in the first 10 years of ascertainment in Oxfast, so 2002 to 2012, to, to get a cohort of over 2,000 people and to look at what the associations were with dementia across the whole range of severity of cerebrovascular events. So if we look first at, at pre-event dementia, so this is the amount of dementia that's there already before the person presents with their acute cerebrovascular event. Somewhat surprisingly, you might think there is a very tight coupling between the likelihood of dementia or the prevalence of dementia and the severity of the presenting event. Um, this might uh, not have been expected because of course these people haven't yet presented with an event, but it suggests that there are sort of factors that determine both susceptibility to dementia and susceptibility to stroke. And indeed, results from elsewhere show that um, if you have cognitive impairment, you're at greater risk of stroke and you're at greater risk of more severe stroke. And then we were able to look at the incidence of new dementia after a cerebrovascular event. So this is excluding people with dementia before the event. And again, we see a very tight coupling in one and five year incidence of new dementia with event severity. So, so the lowest rates in TIA and the highest rates in the most severe stroke. But I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that the rates in TIA are actually not negligible, affecting around 15% of patients by, by, by five years. And what I didn't mention on the previous slide is that those, those rates of dementia are also impacted by whether or not you've had a pre-existing stroke, as, as we looked at in the systematic review. So if you're presenting with a first ever TIA, your risk of dementia are going to be relatively low. But as we showed at the beginning in the systematic review, if you've already had a stroke and you're presenting with a further major stroke, then your risk of dementia will be extremely high. So there's a big impact of the number of, of stroke events. And one thing that was interesting that we were able to look at in the oxyvascular study was that even for non-disabling events, there is still this coupling that you can measure between the risk of dementia and the severity of events. So even within non-disabling events, your risk will be higher if you have a minor stroke than if you have a TIA. And what about the time course after the event? So this probably won't surprise you to if you've worked on the acute stroke unit, for example. So, so this is looking at the cumulative incidence of new dementia after the cerebrovascular events. And this is stratified by the severity of the presenting event. And this is the incidence over time after the event out to five years. And, and what you can see is that the, as we saw in the previous slides, that if you have more severe events, your risks are higher than if you have more minor events. But also importantly, the risk is very much front loaded. So the risk is really at its highest in the immediate post-event period and relatively less thereafter. And that front loading is most apparent for the most severe events. It's still there for more minor events, but it's harder to see, particularly on this slide. So a lot of front loading of risk. And what about lesion location? So we haven't looked at this in a lot of detail yet in Oxfast, but um, there was a big systematic, uh, sorry, a big um, consortium um, study published recently in Lancet Neurology where they took data from a lot of different stroke cohorts and they looked at how lesion location impacted the risk of dementia. And as you uh, won't be surprised to hear, there are certain key locations that will increase the risk of dementia and also having infarcts in more than one location. So it's not just having a lot of strokes that increases your risk. It's also if they're distributed in different locations around the brain. Um, and also some previous work from Sandra Black and colleagues um, in Korea suggesting that 
specific locations in terms of pathways are also important and specific neural networks, including in cholinergic pathways. So lesion location is also important. Now, um, that's all very well. So we can, we've seen that the, the risks of, of dementia after cerebrovascular events are much greater after more severe events than they are, are after uh, more minor events. But we need to be able to sort of place that in the context of what we would expect in the age and sex matched uh, background population. Because, of course, this is a generally older population in whom the risks of dementia are not negligible. Um, and so um, we were able to compare our OXFAS study findings with those from the MRC Cognitive Function and Aging Study um, directed by Carol Brain. Um, in Cambridge, and they've um, ascertained um, prevalence and incidence of dementia rates spanning several decades in the UK. Um, and the first thing to note is that they've noted, as have people from elsewhere in the world, that the age-specific rates of dementia are actually lower now than they were two or three decades earlier. Now, obviously, that, that's good news. Um, the reasons for that are not clear, but it's felt that <clears throat> probably some uh, better control of vascular risk factors is important, together with better other sort of lifestyle and, and health measures. Um, so when we compared our OXFAS data with, with CFAS, of course, we took the more recent um, estimates for uh, prevalence and incidence of dementia. And what we found was that um, there is an indeed an excess risk in people who've had cerebrovascular events compared to what we would expect in the age and sex matched uh, background. Um, and interestingly, that is elevated even in people with the more minor events. So if you have a TIA, your risk of dementia are threefold what we would expect in the first year. Um, they are relatively less thereafter at double the risk. However, if we look in people presenting with severe strokes, there is really a huge fold increase in risk, particularly in the first year after severe stroke, and that is relatively less uh, thereafter. If we look at the, the dementia prevalence estimates compared to what we'd expect in age and sex matched um, background population, the, the multiplier is less from having had a, a cerebrovascular event, and that's probably because of survivor bias. So a lot of the patients who have severe events and develop dementia don't survive very long. So what does this mean on a, a population-based level? So again, this is comparing the OXFASC uh, data with data from CFAS um, shown here. And, and what we can think of is that having a cerebrovascular event will, will bring forward the onset of dementia. It will result in cognitive aging. And we've estimated that to be around two years for TIA, about double that for non-disabling minor stroke, and up to 15 years or more for moderate to severe stroke. So really a, a big impact on the cognitive aging effect in the population. So the more we can do to prevent cerebrovascular events, the more we will maintain people um, in terms of healthy cognitive aging. And our estimates have actually been um, matched by similar estimates from a group at CTSU using completely different methodology and data. So we, we think these are probably fairly robust estimates. And so we tried to look and see whether we, we could see similar um, trends in the absolute rates of, of dementia over the last two, three decades in stroke, as has been seen in the CFAS studies. Um, and this is pooling data from um, across available studies in stroke uh, that have dementia outcomes. And it seems to suggest that there is a reduction in prevalence of dementia over the last three decades in the post-stroke population. Obviously, there's the problems of differences in methodology between studies, but we do seem to be seeing a, a similar signal there. Um, so what, what happens when we look at the risk factors for dementia after TIA and stroke? Um, so we've talked about um, the burden of the lesion in terms of the numbers of lesions and the severity of the event and also lesion location. These are data from OXFAS. But also we have to take into account the susceptibility or the, the brain reserve, if you like. So what the state of the brain is at the time of the stroke. So 
Factors that are measuring that are also related to uh, dementia after a stroke. So if you have a more frail brain or a less well-educated brain, your risk of dementia after a stroke will be, be higher. Um, and just to bring uh, highlight just two other points, that if you measure cognition immediately in the post-stroke period, it's very predictive of future dementia risk, probably because it's capturing previous sort of uh, brain status and the impact of the lesion. And in terms of diabetes, um, this is the only vascular risk factor that we found in Oxfast that was important if measured at the time of the event in predicting future dementia, which is interesting because that's not necessarily what you take home from the rest of the literature. And indeed, this is a, a big pooling systematic review that uh, Aubrey McCall has done um, taking all the data from existing published studies, and that does suggest that a lot of other vascular risk factors are linked with post-event dementia. But I just like to highlight that in most of these studies, there was really little adjustment for confounders, even in some cases for age, but certainly for things like stroke severity. So I think that's why we see uh, perhaps univariate associations that aren't maintained when you make the appropriate adjustments. Um, so I just come on to, to talk about transient impairments now. So I've talked about baseline uh, cognition being very predictive of future dementia in this population. Um, that is also the case for, for particularly people presenting with quite minor events. Um, so if you have a baseline low cognitive score that then improves by one month, you might think, oh, the patient's got better and therefore they're not going to be at higher risk of of dementia later on, but in fact, that's not what we see. So having that baseline drop in your cognition, even if you recover later, is still revealing, if you like, of cognitive fragility. And this has a lot of analogies with delirium, which I'll come on to talk about later. So, so just the fact that you recover early after the event doesn't mean that all is okay. And probably having that baseline impact on cognition is a marker, if you like, of, of susceptibility of the brain. And um, other analogous conditions, of course, are AKI. So we often see that our old patients in the context of being unwell will, will drop their renal function, but that will then subsequently recover. But again, that seems to be predictive of future um, renal problems. Um, so I'll, I'll come on to talk a little bit about genetic risk factors. So for those of you who work more in the neurodegenerative field, you'll be uh, more aware than I am of the importance of apolipoprotein E genotype. And up until recently, it wasn't very clear how that related to dementia associated with stroke. Um, and that was really because I hadn't appreciated this till we started looking at our data that the E4 genotype, the epsilon-4 genotype, which is associated with increased risk of sporadic Alzheimer's disease, is actually not so prevalent in the general population. And certainly the homozygous status by um, people in older ages is really quite rare. And this means that you have to have large sample sizes to be able to confidently establish whether um, epsilon-4 genotype is important or not. And so we looked at it in the, the Oxfask um, participants, and we found that there was an association with homozygous status and pre-event dementia. And it was also associated with the development of new post-event dementia. And importantly, this was robust to adjustment for vascular burden. So it wasn't just that having epsilon-4 genotype homozygosity meant that you were more likely to have a lot of white matter disease or more likely to have a more severe stroke. It seemed to be acting independently of that. Um, and we, we took this to indicate that it was probably marking coexistent neurodegenerative pathology. Um, importantly, we didn't see any association with uh, heterozygous status um, that is there in, in the bigger um, Alzheimer's disease cohorts. Um, another important thing to think about when we're considering risk factors is, is how do the risk factor associations differ if we're looking at early dementia after stroke versus later dementia after stroke? And there's some work from Vincent Mock um, in Hong Kong and colleagues to show that probably if we consider later dementia in isolation, that small vessel disease is very important. 
So having confluent white matter changes or lacoons, a lot of lacoons is, is a key risk factor. And some data from Louise Allen and Raj Kaleri in Newcastle, um, again, looking at long term dementia risk, um, that multiple vascular risk factors seem to be important, possibly through the mediation of small vessel disease. Um, recurrent stroke, of course, is an important factor for us to think about in terms of late risk. But in fact, recurrence rates nowadays with robust secondary prevention are in fact very low. So that doesn't really account for most of the risk. Um, Prof Mock and colleagues have tried to look at the role of neurodegeneration um, as opposed to vascular pathology um, in the development of dementia after stroke using PET studies, um, markers of amyloid. Um, these studies are really challenging to do um, and they seem to see quite low rates of PIB uptake. So they didn't feel that accrual of neurodegeneration was, was as important as small vessel disease accrual in, in this population. Um, and data from our studies in Oxford would suggest that APOE E4 homozygosity appears overall more important in later dementia. So we think for patients with minor events, it probably is important in the accrual of neurodegeneration. But in major events, it seemed to be more important in accelerating a cognitive decline early on. So we think there might be some interactions between the acute stroke event if it's more severe and any underlying neurodegenerative pathology, but that, that's speculative really at the moment. So, um, so I've talked about the um, data from OPSVASC in relation to dementia after stroke and TIA. I'm going to come on in the second half of the talk now to, to really discuss um, delirium and its role in dementia risk and, and really start to touch on these more messy contributors really to cognitive frailty in old people. So um, I know I'm not talking to an audience who primarily work in, in the sort of acute illness sphere, um, but you will nevertheless come across this if you are clinicians. And even if you're not clinicians, you will come across it in relatives, particularly older relatives. So um, there was an important report from the Royal College of Physicians back in 2012 now, really highlighting that we've had a huge change in case mix in the general hospital over the last two to three decades. And those of us in clinical practice will be aware of that. So two thirds of our patients now in, in inpatient beds are older people. Many of them are frail and many of them will have a diagnosis of dementia. And our services, of course, are not really equipped or developed to deal with this, this change in, in case mix and particularly complexity relating to cognitive frailty. Um, and this is just to show you some data from acute medicine here at Oxford University Hospitals. So um, this is consecutive unselected data um, of acute medicine admissions and really showing that across the age uh, strata, we can see that really delirium is not really a major issue for us outside the ICU. Um, but then rates really start to, to increase in, in uh, old age um, and really reach very high rates at what we would call the oldest old, so 80 years and above. Um, so really very high rates, sort of 40%. Um, however, if we look at the number of people who are coming in with pre-admission dementia diagnosis, it's much lower than that. So it's around 20, 25 percent. And if we go around the wards um, testing people, about 50 percent or more of our older inpatients in acute medicine, 75 years or older, are functioning at a dementia level. So, so we can um, take this as really sort of demonstrating the very high burden of cognitive frailty in, in the acute hospital medical setting. Um, and this is just to show us that really that if we think about just known dementia diagnosis in our patients, it's the tip of the iceberg. Um, there are people coming in who have dementia but who don't have a diagnosis. There are people coming in who were previously fine but then in the context of acute illness are no longer fine and develop delirium. And then there are other people who develop um, transient cognitive impairments, like we saw with TIA, that might be less overt. But if we go and test them, that we can see that they've got a low cognitive test score. 
And of course, the outcomes of these different groups are quite variable. You know, some people will recover, as I showed you with TIA, at least in the short term. Some of our patients will just experience a very precipitous and accelerated cognitive decline. And some of them, we make a dementia diagnosis because it was unrecognized prior to admission. And I've shown you about the high proportion of people um, in medicine who score in the sort of region of dementia if we go around testing them on the wards. But again, just to highlight that many of these people don't already have a dementia diagnosis. And importantly, it's not restricted to medicine. If we go around general surgery and we test people who don't already have dementia, a quarter of them who are 75 or above are running in a dementia range in their cognitive assessments. And of course, this has got all sorts of implications, for example, for capacity and consent to procedures. So it is a huge issue for us in terms of managing our patients and, of course, a huge issue for patients and families. So one of the things that we were interested to do using the OxFASC um, study, because as I've shown you, it's got very detailed longitudinal um, in-person follow-up. And so this really um, is very powerful um, if we link it then to, to hospital admissions data in that cohort. Because one of the challenges about studying delirium is that um, if we just take the patients when they're pitching up in the hospital, of course, we don't really know what they were like before they were admitted. I mean, we can talk to relatives and we can try and establish how they were, but it's not as robust as having you know, pre-admission data. Um, and so a lot of studies in delirium have focused on elective surgical cohorts because, of course, you can assess them before their surgery. And then the people who have delirium, you can look at them when they're delirious at the point of post-surgery. Um, however, the majority of people in the acute hospital who have these problems are not in surgery. They are in medicine um, and in other medical specialties. So it, it really means we can't study the people that we're most that are the biggest issue in the system. So by linking the Oxford vascular study data to electronic hospital admissions on follow-up, and these early data are just using HES-type data, so quite limited, but we supplemented it with uh, hand searching of records. We can begin to look about what is it about the pre-existing features of patients or people that makes them more susceptible to having delirium if they do become unwell and have to be admitted. Um, and one of the things that we looked at first was um, what about the baseline brain imaging? So are there features on baseline brain imaging that are linked to increasing risk of delirium on follow-up? Um, so we looked at both uh, white matter change, and I called it white matter change because at this point in Oxfast, probably a majority of the patients had CT scanning. So this is not fancy MRI, this is basic CT. And we use visual ratings to assess uh, white matter change, severity and cerebral atrophy. And where patients had MRI, we, we harmonized it. So we used data from whichever type of scan they had. And what we saw was that there were associations with, with delirium up to five years later. So even if people were admitted five years later, the baseline brain imaging predicted their risk of delirium, and that was adjusted for age and sex. However, um, what we saw when we did further adjustments for other potential con confounders, important confounders, such as the severity of the baseline cerebrovascular event and illness severity, um, and the level of pre-admission cognitive impairment from the OxFAS cognitive scores. Interestingly, we found that the white matter change was still predictive and really it made very little impact adjusting for pre-admission cognition. So, so having a lot of white matter change on your baseline scan really increased your risk of delirium. However, in atrophy, um, when we adjusted for all these factors, including cognition, then the um, associations with atrophy seem to become much attenuated. So atrophy didn't seem to be as informative as white matter change um, when we took cognition into account. And there have been studies, as I said, from the elective surgical population that would suggest that, again, small vessel disease is an important predictor of risk, um, as is atrophy. But in the studies looking at atrophy, most of them 
have not adjusted or, or fewer of them have adjusted for, for the cognition um, pre-admission, which obviously is important. And aligned to that, we also looked at the cognitive profile. So um, were there specific cognitive domains that predicted your delirium risk on follow-up? Um, and we have just MMSE and MOCA data. So in OXAS, we don't have large neuropsychological batteries, partly because it's not really feasible to do in the context of all the other assessments. Um, but what we found was that there were associations with not just the severity of the cognitive impairment pre-admission, as you might not be surprised to hear, but there were also associations specifically with impairment in frontal executive domains as well as memory. And we took that as indicating that patients with a, a higher cerebrovascular load, really in keeping with having more white matter change on their baseline scan, were at increased risk of delirium. So the cognitive profile we thought reflected the underlying neuropathology um, and therefore delirium risk. Um, and this is uh, just some work from colleagues, um, Hugh Marcus and uh, John O'Brien in Cambridge, um, looking at or demonstrating really that small vessel disease is associated with both microglial activation and increased blood brain barrier permeability. Um, so that might be one mechanism by which um, small vessel disease increases the risk of delirium. And I'll, I'll come on to, to talk a little bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. Um, so just to come back to this high rate of delirium in the acute hospital, um, one of the um, things that we've shown is that delirium is a potent driver of hospital admission. You're very unlikely con to continue under what's called an ambulatory pathway. If you're seen in one of the emergency ambulatory units, the key drivers of hospital admission are delirium, illness, severity and frailty. Um, so, of course, whilst these ambulatory pathways are, are fantastic and are mitigating admission rates and trying to sort of... Um, stave off, if you like, this huge tidal wave of emissions and in the context of re reduced bed space. It is, in fact, the older, more frail and delirious patients who will be not suitable for management on those pathways. Um, and if you look at hospital cohorts, both from our data and data from elsewhere, vascular dementia seems to be overrepresented um, over and above what we might expect you know, people being admitted for a stroke. And we think it might be um, because these patients seem to be more susceptible to delirium. If delirium is a big driver of admission, then we'd expect relatively more vascular dementia than Alzheimer's type dementia in the hospital population than what we would expect on their, their sort of distribution in the sort of community dwelling cohorts. And um, just to sort of um, develop that point about interactions between the brain and the systemic milieu. So, so there's quite a lot of data from um, animal studies indicating the really important role that the systemic milieu has in maintaining neuronal function. Um, and there were some uh, quite uh, or very interesting experiments published back in Nature where they exposed young mice to the systemic milieu of aging mice and then vice versa. And they found that the aging systemic milieu was really quite um, uh, influential in changing how the young mice behaved and in also what their brains looked like um, when they did the histology. Um, so really very important. Um, and further work from Ranzerhoff um, and colleagues showing that really um, the blood brain barrier function, the dial function very much rests with um, a supportive network and an integrity of the blood brain barrier. And that if that all starts not to work properly, then you get a cascade of processes that increases neuroinflammation. Um, and of course, aging is, is thought to be a pro-inflammatory state. And of course, acute illness is a very inflammatory state in many cases. And yet that's something that really hasn't been as well addressed, I think, in studies. Um, and just in terms of the sort of genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, we know that there's a lot of um, risk around factors um, to do with immunological responses, uh, as well as clearance of, of proteins. 
Um, so coming on to think about that in relation to Oxfask and our linkage to hospitalizations on follow-up, there have been some studies in the post-stroke population trying to tease out in terms of future dementia risk, other factors that are not just the stroke itself. So um, people have looked at sort of complications around the time of stroke and also admissions on follow-up or episodes on follow-up um, where there's an acute illness or perturbation to homeostasis. Um, they didn't um, tease out the different factors because they had relatively small cohorts and they sort of lumped them all in together. Um, but they did seem to see that there was an association between these episodes and an increased dementia risk after they adjusted as, as much as they could for confounding factors. Now, as I said, they had relatively small cohorts and they, they weren't able to look at delirium at that time, but, but some evidence that it was important. And then if we look in the non-stroke um, cohorts and non-stroke studies, um, there's been evidence for a while that infection is a risk factor for dementia. Um, and it appears linked to infection severity. So if you have more severe infection, your risk of dementia is greater. But there's really not much information about how that might depend on the underlying neuropathology or whether it therefore influences risk um, disproportionately in relation to future dementia subtype. Um, and there was a big study published recently in Lancet Infectious Diseases um, looking at across several cohorts, and they only had coding um, for dementia subtypes, so administrative uh, coding on follow-up for dementia, which we know is, is limited. But those data suggested that the risk of dementia after infection was in fact greater for vascular dementia than it was for Alzheimer's disease, suggesting that it's something again about vascular pathology that seems to enhance the risk um, post after infection. So very interesting uh, data. Um, and they weren't able to look in those previous studies in the stroke cohorts or non-stroke cohorts really at the impact of, of delirium as opposed to other acute illness factors. Um, and we know from uh, cohort studies in, in what's been termed Alzheimer's disease, just maybe the clinical diagnosis, that delirium seems to alter the cognitive trajectory. So it's not just that people are already vulnerable and the delirium is a manifestation of, in some way of the dementia. It seems to actually accelerate cognitive decline in people who already have established dementia. Um, and this is just um, to um, think about how that might be happening and to come back again to this concept of blood-brain barrier integrity. So it's thought that the same factors that drive delirium are then also factors that cross the blood-brain barrier and interact with existing neuropathology to increase the risk of dementia. Again, this is all very speculative, but that is the way it's thought to happen. So um, we were interested to look at this in Oxfast because, as I said, there's lots of challenges about looking at this in humans. Um, but the longitudinal nature of Oxfast and our ability to link to hospitalizations data really is uniquely powerful because then we can look at, at how this acute illness episode and the specific features of that acute illness, the complications or causes of the acute illness, how they influence the risk of dementia over and above other factors that we know are important. Um, and I'm going to present data really on that are quite preliminary on this. And we've used really quite um, basic electronic hospitalizations data, as I said, supplemented with hand searching of records. Um, in future studies, um, because we now have really much more detailed data from electronic patient records here in the OUH, we will be able to get a lot more detail, including, for example, laboratory results and measures of, of really quite um, detailed measures of illness severity. But the data I'm going to talk about today really is quite basic um, electronic data.
So uh, we were interested to look at um, how admissions um, on follow-up in our Oxfast cohort, so hospitalizations associated with infection or associated with delirium, influence the risk, a five-year risk of dementia. And what we saw was that when we looked at the cohort overall, uh, if you look at just after adjustment for age and gender, there is an effect of both infection and delirium. However, if you just saw all the factors that we know are important in dementia risk in the Oxfast cohort, then the association with infection disappears, but the um, association with delirium is still there. However, what we then did um, on the basis of our previous work and those of others is we stratified the uh, data by the presence of baseline brain imaging, white matter change, no versus yes. And what we saw in the group um, without any baseline white matter change or just mild changes is that delirium was still a powerful risk factor for dementia over and above any other factors, but infection really wasn't. However, when we looked in the group with moderate to severe white matter change, what we saw was that delirium and infection appeared to be important. And infection severity was also important. So people with more infection severity had a greater delirium risk, dementia risk, sorry, compared to people with infections that were designated as localized or mild. So an effect of infection only in those with moderate to severe white matter change that wasn't seen in those without, whereas delirium seemed to be important in dementia risk, irrespective of the underlying neurovascular pathology. And just allied to that, um, we looked at the risk factor associations more broadly um, in our Oxfast cohort, incorporating the acute illness factors that we had at this stage, plus other factors that we know or thought could be important in dementia risk on follow-up. And interestingly, what you can see is that there are differences, as I highlighted, between delirium and infection, according to the presence of the, the baseline um, SVD or not. But other risk factors also are modulated by the brain imaging findings. So as you might expect, sort of more vascular risk factors in people with SVD, but also importantly, having a low cognitive test score <clears throat> was more important in people without SVD than with SVD. APOE genotype suggestive of neurodegeneration and also importantly, comorbidity burden. So more important in the group without small vessel disease change. So we think that this is really sort of um, grouping the risk factors, if you like, in a way that sort of indicates the underlying dementia subtype. So Alzheimer's predominant in this group without SVD and more vascular predominant in the group with more moderate severe SVD. And this has got implications really for, for predicting risk or, or creating risk models. One of the things that we're interested to do is to try and do a better job of prognostication in our older hospitalised patients. And we think that these factors may actually allow us to be able to do that um, more effectively and certainly more effectively than if we don't incorporate brain imaging. And of course, it would also predict likely predominant dementia subtype, which is important then for trials and also for individualised sort of targeted um, interventions. So I'll just finish now as sort of um, thinking about the development of dementia and we're talking about a vascular cohort of course but I think this probably applies in the more general sort of non-vascular populations in that it, we can't think about the brain just in isolation so we have to think about it in the context of all these other things that affect people as they get older so comorbidity burden, frailty, and also these really quite frequent occurrences of acute illness. Um, about 60% of our Oxfast cohorts had an admission within five years at a mean age of about 72. Um, so it's really not an infrequent occurrence. And of course, you know, some people have these episodes and they don't get ill enough to get to hospital. So I think we have to think about it in terms of 
you know, a series of accrued insults, if you like, that are impacting a vulnerable brain. And it's those factors together that then are driving the dementia risk. So I'll just finish now about implications for management. So obviously for those people working in stroke, um, I think doing a cognitive test is very important. And that's also really key in the general hospital environment, which is why we've tried to drive cognitive screening in that group. And also because it informs care at the time of admission. Um, of course, recurrent stroke should be prevented as, as much as possible. And acute stroke treatments looking to reduce stroke severity will probably improve cognitive outcomes. So that's not proven yet. Um, acute stroke units probably improve uh, stroke outcome partly because they reduce stroke complications. Um, we need to be thinking about maintaining brain health really from early life onwards. Um, because that makes your brain less vulnerable to the impact of secondary insults. And I think the jury's out on whether sort of aggressive vascular risk factor management after stroke is really going to have that much benefit in the short term. It probably will have more benefit in the longer term and in more selected groups. Um, and if we think about delirium risk, um, it seems to be mediated in part by cerebrovascular disease burden um, and therefore sort of pre-existing vascular pattern of cognitive impairment. And this is possibly through increased cerebral susceptibility to systemic factors. We think that the blood-brain barrier permeability is probably important. And through those mechanisms, we think that sort of systemic insults are probably going to prove to be an important contributor to dementia risk after stroke but they're likely to be modulated by the underlying neuropathology with certain insults being more important um, according to the presence or absence of vascular pathology. Um, and I'll finish there. Thank you um, for your attention. Thanks so much, Sarah. You covered a lot of territory there. Uh, yes. <laughs> Um, I'm going to ask people to put some post their questions in the chat, and some of you already started to do so. Um, and maybe I could start with those, Sarah, and I'll come to yeah, sure. On my own if I can. So Nick asked a sort of fundamental question, Nick Wilcox: um, How would you define the delirium? How's it defined? Um, so yeah, I mean that's a good question. So it's not; it's one of these syndromic diagnoses. There's a lot of analogies with dementia. Um, so in the same way as dementia, you're looking for a pattern uh, that is um, consistent with the syndrome, but it may vary between individuals. And also the distinction between dementia and mild cognitive impairment is to some extent arbitrary. That's a big problem in, in research. So in delirium, it's very similar. So we're looking at a pattern of uh, symptoms and uh, signs that are consistent uh, with the syndromic definition that's now in DSM-5. So it's really looking for behavioral change. So <clears throat> attentional change is quite a key one. It's looking for the fact that this is an acute onset. It's not like what the patient is, the person is usually, um, and that it's associated with an underlying, usually general medical, but can be other medical or sy uh, systemic disorder, and is not otherwise better explained by another process. Great, thanks, that's very helpful. And Yvonne Couch has lots of questions, but she's particularly interested in uh, whether you know for stroke patients if TPA, uh, clot buster, or thrombect thrombectomy makes any difference in terms of dementia progression or risk. Yeah, so I only alluded very, very briefly at the end to that. Um, and I think that's a really key question. And I think that the new the trials of new acute stroke treatments um, must include a, a cognitive um, endpoint for that reason. Um, there was some data, I think published in Neurology, it was on my last slide, to suggest that um, thrombectomy did improve outcomes, not just in terms of sort of physical function, but also in cognitive function. And I think, I mean, the data from Oxfask and elsewhere, because there's such a tight coupling between 
the severity of the event and the risk of dementia. I think it's not unreasonable to hope that having treatments to reduce the burden of the acute lesion will be helpful. Okay. And Paul White says, um, what future role do you think blood-based biomarkers and related omics technologies will play in the characterization of dementia cohorts? I guess that's also from the, from the acute phase and delirium as well. Yeah, that absolutely. So I, I think this is going to be really key. Um, and it's something that we're keen to take forward. Um, so one of the um, things that we found in our work was that the um, it's been assumed that the dementia risk associated with delirium is being driven by the same things that are causing the delirium. And that's often been attributed to infection. So because we know that infection increases dementia risk, it's been assumed that delirium is there because there's infection and that's what's driving the dementia risk. However, in our data, we seem to be seeing that delirium, even in the absence of identified infection, is driving dementia risk. So there must be other mechanisms that are important. But one of the problems, and you alluded to this, Ms. Hood, is that it's such a messy area in that, you know, is it just that we've not identified the infective driver of delirium in that patient? Um, or is it really the case that there isn't delirium? I mean, what I will say from my clinical experience is that often people will come in with delirium and they'll get put on antibiotics because people, well, we haven't identified a cause, but we'll just give them some empirical antibiotics. Um, and that sometimes we have people even with quite persistent delirium who we do that for and it doesn't get better, um, suggesting that there are other drivers. Um, and I think the um, omics and the sort of more molecular techniques would be very helpful in teasing out exactly what the associates of the delirium are and what the drivers of future dementia are, um, because at the minute it's, it's too messy to be certain. Um, but we certainly seem to be seeing associations between delirium and dementia that aren't obviously linked to infection. And certainly many of my patients will become delirious if they get very constipated. And that's clearly... Any, any perturbation might just push them over the, the edge. Yes. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Might come back to that. Um, Bart Sheehan asks, how reliable do you think general hospital diagnoses of delirium are? It's important in longitudinal research using coding or free text diagnoses. Yes. Reliable. Yeah, so if, you, if we talk about coding, um, so we looked at that in uh, the data locally. And what we saw was that, well, firstly, that there was a huge improvement in delirium coding. Um, so the number of cases of true delirium that got coded administratively went from sort of 12% back in 2012 um, to approaching or over 60% in 2018. And that's, that's partly through the work we've done with colleagues on the ground, but also the coding team. But what this shows is that the coding is highly specific. So if you get given a delirium code, you have got delirium. The problem is that there's a lot of people with delirium who don't get coded. So it's a sensitivity issue, not a specificity issue. Mm -hmm. So that is a problem for longitudinal cohort data in which coding is very insensitive, which is pretty much everywhere. Um, apart from a few institutions like here and possibly Manchester and Edinburgh, where they've been a big drive to improve it. Um, so I think that is a limitation for longitudinal studies um, if you're using big data. And I think that's why our studies are going to be so valuable, because we've driven the routine assessment of delirium hard and we are doing studies at the moment to look at the validity of the routinely acquired delirium diagnosis. And whilst a lot of my uh, colleagues will um, put delirium equals uncertain on the electronic recording, we have looked at the data and it suggests that actually those people likely have delirium and can be treated as a yes. Um, and because we've got gold standard cohorts already, we can check that the electronic data is, is giving us 
reasonable estimates. Yeah, um, I mean, just briefly on that score, there was always this sort of dichotomy, wasn't there, between the quietly delirious ones and the <laughs> yeah. very yeah. wonderfully delirious ones. I mean, yeah. do you think that's actually the case, that the quiet ones get missed more or uncertain? I, I think that's true. Um, I mean, we're hoping that in the way we sort of designed it in the OUH in terms of routine assessments, we try and highlight the fact that the screening tool that they use may be insensitive for more sleepy patients. And I, I, I mean, just from personal experience, I think their awareness is massively improved compared to how it used to be in the past. Yeah. However, again, when we looked at our coding data, another point that doesn't come up is that, of course, the coding data does not tell you about prevalent ear delirium versus incident, i.e. what's there when we pitch up versus what develops during admission. And the coding in our data sets is better for when they pitch up with it because everyone has to screen on admission and it may not be as well documented if it then occurs during admission. Right, right. So um, I wanted to get on to mechanism because you were shifting us towards thinking about the idea that there might be at least two big groups. One which depends on existing small vessel disease, and that already makes your brain frail, perhaps because it's got widespread network you know, impairments, which is yes. pushed over the edge to get you there. And then there's this other group who might more likely have a clinical diagnosis or, of Alzheimer's, or at least they're not SVD. And yeah. they're more prone to you know, other factors like their baseline cognitive state. Yeah. But, I mean, do you want to enlarge a bit on that, sort of speculate what, what, where you think this is going? Yeah, well, I think it's very interesting. Um, I mean, one of the other things that we found with when we looked at the impact of infection um, was that it almost seemed to have a greater impact in people with SVD who had normal cognition to start with. Mm -hmm. Um, so it sort of seemed to have a relatively greater impact in those people. Um, and whether in the SVD cohort, it sort of sets off a vicious cycle whereby that you've already got a vulnerable brain and then the infection um, actually sort of enhances or accelerates small vessel disease um, in a way that makes those people become um, more apparently impaired than people who are already quite far down the line. In terms of the people without the small vessel disease, um, the answer is I really don't know what, um, they seem to have an increased risk of dementia with delirium, even though they haven't got the small vessel disease. And I don't know whether that's just because there are other factors besides infection that are somehow interacting with neurodegeneration in a different way. Um, or whether, just, right, sorry, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, or whether it's even um, within the brain itself. So it's not in those patients being driven by external factors. Right, yeah. Well, maybe that's what I was thinking of, is that, you know, if, um, if you had two people um, who, you know, one has SVD, but no cognitive impairment, one has Alzheimer's disease and quite, significant impairment you're saying to me that that level of impairment would have to be quite a lot to match the person with svd is that the kind of way you're thinking in terms of their vulnerability to to getting delirium i think you're probably right um i i think that's probably correct um and i, I think that would be one interpretation of what we found um i think we we need to do, obviously we need to do more studies and particularly sort of adjusting or stratifying for baseline cognitive level to really tease this out. Um, but I, I think that's probably correct. Yeah, I'm only asking you to speculate. I know you haven't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah just yeah. trying to think about it um, in terms of yeah. potential significance. Because yeah. I guess, in, you know, in the MS world and in, in other worlds where inflammation is a big issue, blood-brain barrier inflammation. Yes. You know, we, we, we might consider a brave new world where you try to protect people from delirium if you had agents that could affect the blood-brain barrier, if that turns out to be an important mechanism. Yes, I agree. And, and maybe also thinking about 
things that could dampen down or, or reduce those that systemic inflammatory response mm -hmm. in those people. But I I sort of would see it as being targeted according to the presence of small vessel disease. Right. those certain factors and then maybe it wouldn't work for people without the small vessel disease so I think it offers opportunities to think about more individualized strategies or treatment development yeah big market <laughs> it would be <laughs> yes <laughs> um, <laughs> yes any, any more questions for Sarah um, because you've had a, that's been a really great seminar anyone else want to ask anything let's give you a moment Okay, Sarah, that's been fantastic. Right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, thanks for the invitation, Steve. Yeah, thanks for explaining things so clearly, and I'm sure we all got a lot out of it. Yeah. Thanks again. Thanks. Bye bye, everyone.